discussion on exploring new frontiers for service sectors. And I will leave the floor for Kevin to introduce his panel. Thank you, Kevin. Hi, good, good afternoon. Sorry, it's the graveyard, graveyard, graveyard shift. Happy to see at least a few people here. And welcome to this panel discussion on exploring new frontiers for services sector. I really think this is an incredible session because I think services is what we are talking less for the moment about when we talk about SECPA, but it's probably where there's the most opportunities going forward. So I'm really delighted to be here today. Uh, let's, let's remember that SECPA on the services um, side looks at liberalizing and promoting trade in services, which includes the promotion of mutual recognition of professions. It is also about improving the efficiency and competitiveness of the party's services sectors with the ultimate goal, of course, of expanding trade and investments. And thirdly, it's also about joint exploitation, joint exploitation of commercial and economic opportunities in non-parties. Really what we're trying to say is together for Africa. But those three areas are distinct and each incredibly important for Mauritius uh, as we move forward. India is obviously the, the, the larger partner when we talk about services. It's 49% of its GDP. Its exports in services is around 214 billion, and it is a net exporter of services. But it really does it mainly through cross-border service supply, which those of us who've worked on uh, economic cooperation know it's called mode one. Mauritius, with regards to India, we they have, India has a 402 million exports and 101 million imports from Mauritius for the moment. Really quite not that much when we think about the opportunities uh, that are there. 
particularly when we look at what SECPA covers. SECPA would cover 94 services sectors, and this is a really broad uh, segmentation, going from professional services, business services, financial services, and telecommunications. Really, this is very, very much uh, a large scope for the services sector. And for the Mauritian service providers, since we're in Mauritius and we're talking from the Mauritian business point of view uh, in, in many ways, it really is giving Mauritius service providers access to one of the most restrictive services market in the world. India has very little opening for other countries when it comes to services, but thanks to SEPCA, Mauritius has opened doors in those 94 service sectors. Great opportunities. Now, locally, when we're talking about things um, today in the business community, and I think more than the business community with the with general press, we talk about what do we gain and what do we lose uh, when we talk about bilaterals. Obviously, what we can gain is huge in bilateral just because of the opening to a new services market. But really, the, the, the thrust of the discussion today is how can we partner together for new markets, for Africa. And let's not forget a few figures. Africa, we're talking about a services market of 153.1 billion USD in 2019. Huge. And a combined GDP of more than 4 trillion. Certainly a market that is extremely important for us. So to answer these questions today, we have really a great panel with us today. Um, I don't really think they need an introduction, but since uh, it is my job to, uh, to, to do this, uh, let me start with uh, Mr. Uh, Sunil Benimadu, who is the chief executive of the Stock Exchange of Mauritius. Uh, Sunil joined the Stock Exchange as chief executive in May 1998. He's Besides uh, being the chief executive of the SEM, he has been a board member of International Federation of Stock Exchanges, the World Federation of Exchanges, of Exchanges, and president of the African Securities Exchange Association. He's also very involved on the National Committee of Corporate Governance as a board member. He's on the Financial Reporting Council and also on Russia's finance. So really a very broad view of public and private regulatory issues. Next to Sunil, maybe a, a big hand of applause for, for Sunil, for those who are here. Thank you for being with us, Sunil. Next to Sunil, we've got uh, Ms. Krishna Gangopadhyay, uh, who is the MD and CEO of Afrinex Exchange. Uh, it's a pan-African stock exchange that is based in Mauritius. But beyond her very important role, uh, Ms. Gangopadhyay, Krishna, has been instrumental in improving the market microstructure of the Mauritius capital market, really looking at greater access to capital for issuers and investors across the globe. And she comes to us with a huge experience from the Bombay Stock Exchange. And most interestingly, she's been seminal, uh, or contributing responsibly to set up the India International Exchange and the India International Clearing Corporation at Gift City. And for all of us here, Gift City is an entity we need to know more about. And she has had many firsts in advocacy for regulatory and contractual development for the Gift City IFC, fundraising, and also in ESG. And I think this is a key uh, issue. But before that, uh, Krishna has worked uh, on risk solution at Chris Hill, technology and risk models for financial institutions and as a management consultant. So we look forward, Krishna, for a very interesting intervention on your part. Again, a big uh, hand to all of them. Next to Krishna, we have Sridhar. Again, I don't know if Sridhar needs an introduction or not, but a regional manager, a managing director of IQEQ. We, we all know Sridhar as a very seasoned banker, long career with Standard Chartered Bank. I remember those days where you know, he was bringing a lot of, uh, of value add to us uh, as the CEO of Standard Chartered in Mauritius. He's also known for having taken the immense responsibility of establishing MoBank a few years ago. But since, 19, since 2019, Sridhar has been the regional managing director of the IQEQ group for the AIME um, region, headquartered in Mauritius. Now, Sridhar is also has been contributing significantly to the financial services industry in Mauritius, whereas through, uh, through Mauritius Finance, 
of course looking at financial services, but he's also a board member of the National Committee on Corporate Governance. Big hand of applause for Sridhar. And, and last but not least, my former president, the former president of Business Mauritius, but Vidya Mudigan, again, doesn't need any introduction, managing director of Ceridian Mauritius, um, of Ceridian, rather, a global human capital management software company. But I think Ceridian is much beyond human capital uh, management now, but we'll hear so much more about it from, from uh, Vidya. But serving customers in North America, Europe, Africa, Asia, all this from its Mauritius office. Vidya has over 25 years of executive leadership experience, working with businesses in North America, in Europe, in UK, India, South Africa. And in Mauritius, he's been a major contributor to the IT industry and uh, has been recognized by, by several grant awarding organizations, CEO, Global Group, British Computer Society, and he's been president of OTAM in the past, and as I said before, the president of Business Mauritius uh, the, the previous uh, two years ago. And he's really uh, someone who's active on the startup ecosystem. So I, I think we'll be able, through Vidya, to get a much broader dimension of services beyond financial services. Big hand of uh, applause for Vidya also. So without much more ado, I'll jump directly into the questions. Sunil, I wanted to, to start with you. We, we, we are talking about SECPA. We understand the role of the stock exchange of Mauritius in Mauritius, but how can that stock exchange contribute to the unfolding of the SECPA potential with regards to financial services? Thank you, uh, Kevin. And first, I think I would like to uh, extend my sincere thanks to the EDB for having me here uh, uh, this evening to uh, participate on this panel. Well, to answer your question, I think uh, we've all heard since uh, this morning uh, a number of discussions about the huge potential that SECPA represents for the Mauritian companies that wish to extend their reach beyond the shores of Mauritius into the huge market that India represents, but also for the Indian companies that wish to come to Mauritius, but not only to Mauritius, but through Mauritius to try to reach out to the huge potential that uh, Africa represents. I would like, as a start, to share a few additional data with you and then explain how we, as the Stock Exchange of Mauritius, can bring our contribution to the unfolding of the huge potential that SECPA represents. I will start first for the Indian companies and then I'll come to the Mauritian companies. So we are all aware that Mauritius as a country forms part of two of the largest economic blocks in Africa. There is SADC, SADC, which uh, has 16 countries with a population of 366 million people and an overall GDP of about 690 uh, billion uh, USD. On the other hand, Mauritius is also a member of COMESA, and COMESA together brings 21 countries. Of course, some of these countries are both in SADC and in COMESA, but as a regional block, it has, with Egypt, a total GDP of 805 billion US dollars, and a population of 583 uh, million. When you add these two blocks together, you end up with a GDP of $1.3 trillion, which is about 30% of the GDP of India today. And more importantly, uh, you have a reach to uh, you know, a population of 740 million uh, people. So it's very clear that once the current uncertainty that is characterizing the geopolitical situation in the world will abate, will be behind us, we would expect these countries to resume on their 6 to 8 percent annual GDP growth that we've seen them go through prior to COVID and prior to this uh, volatile geopolitical situation. So very clearly, for Indian companies that wish to branch out 
of India and extend their reach in the rest of the world, this region represents a huge potential. And of course, doing it through Mauritius, because of all the uh, preferential access that Mauritius, Mauritian companies would allow, international companies that are structured in Mauritius to access these regions makes a lot of sense. So we would expect that Indian companies, which are already major global players, and especially in sectors in these regions which are growing, I'm talking about healthcare, I'm talking about transport and logistics, I'm talking about fit tech, financial services, telecommunication, and so on and so forth. So you would expect Indian companies to leverage on the SEC path through Mauritius so as to uh, uh, capitalize on this huge potential. And this is where we as a stock exchange, we can come into the play. So how? We have over the last few years been busy building an ecosystem in Mauritius which would allow international companies that are located in Russia, the GBC companies, but also some of the Pan-African institutions, to come and leverage on our platform, but leverage also on the Mauritian jurisdiction for all the uh, advantages that Mauritius present, represents, to raise capital and expand their activities globally, okay? So to do this, we've set up a multi-currency capital raising, listing, trading, and settlement platform, which is tried and tested. In fact, over the last 10 years, 7 billion US dollars have been raised, both by the local listed companies, but also by the GBC and uh, other companies that are listed outside of Mauritius on our platform. And the beauty about this is, you know, Mauritius is a small country. The money may not be raised from Mauritius but it is being raised globally, but through Mauritius. And this is where uh, we, we, we bring uh, some potential advantages for those Indian companies that may look at the uh, Africa potential that I've just described. And then secondly, we've also brought a lot of changes to our listing rules to make these listing rules amenable and conducive to the requirements of those companies that we want to attract. For example, we would allow a company which is uh, structured as a global business company to list and raise capital through our platform without necessarily having a track record, but provided it provides a business plan that stands the test of scrutiny, okay? We've also come up with what we call dual listing, uh, dual currency listing, which would allow one, any of these companies to choose in which currency they want to list, raise capital, and trade. So this would depend on where their investors are. So if they're targeting, let's say, uh, US, uh, US dollar-based investors, they would do it in US dollar. If they want to do it in Euro, they would do it in Euro. But if they want to do it dual, so some of, may, of their main investors are US dollar-based, or, and some in euro base, they could do that. So there's a lot of flexibility that we've brought in uh, other than our listing rules. And we've also given the opportunity to these companies to raise capital through debt, and we've introduced rules for specialist debt, which would allow them to target a few institutional investors, raise you know, big, big, tag, uh, big level of capital, and then list and trade on, on our platform. So there are a number of innovations that we've brought, and the whole idea is to build up the, on the synergistic links that are being created with the global business sector in Mauritius. And now that we are adding a new dimension to the whole ecosystem with SECPA, I think we will also, uh, of course, try to leverage on this uh, new uh, dimension that is being played, this new game that has, well, game in terms of the economic game, and we think that uh, we have an important role in playing to help unfold uh, this potential. Two other things very quickly, because I know you are t uh, pressed by time. We also, we understand that, you know, to make Mauritius an attractive capital raising platform, we need to ensure that we can bring in global order flows to this market. And right now, we are participating, and this will go live in the near future, uh, through, uh, we are participating in an African Development Bank uh, promoted initiative to link 
seven of the exchanges in Africa from North Africa, Morocco, Egypt, uh, Western Africa, Nigeria, Eastern Africa, uh, uh, Nairobi, Southern Africa, uh, Johannesburg and Mauritius. Through technology, we're going to link all these platforms together, which means that brokers from all these exchanges will be able to trade in each other's uh, securities, and in so doing, will be able also to participate in the IPOs, in the capital raising exercises. So this in itself will add a new dimension to what we're trying to achieve from Mauritius by bringing global order flows to our platform. So, in a nutshell, I think we are going there, and we've also, last point, launched uh, an Africa board, which is called AfriDex, where we try to showcase those companies that have businesses in Africa and are generating revenue in Africa. We try to enhance their visibility and, and get them to be better known to the investor population out there. And these com we have 24 securities on this board, and they've raised 1.2 billion US dollars over the last three years, which means that even through AfriDex, you know, if Indian companies wish to be listed on AfriDex and do business uh, uh, through Africa, this is one option, but they could also be listed on our, on, on, on our other platforms. So this is why we, we want, this is how we're going to, you know, bring our contribution to unfolding this potential. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sunil. Very interesting. So basically, a local platform with a lot of possibilities and you're now moving through the African platform, both to raise investments and to promote uh, opportunities through there. That leads me directly to a question to you, uh, Krishna. Afritex has Africa in its name already, Afrinex, and it's been created with a vision of setting up a new state-of-the-art exchange in Mauritius to provide greater access to capital, to issuers and investors across the board. So how, how is SEPCA helping you to fulfill this vision? Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me for this panel. I think there are, uh, the, we first need to understand the impact of SECPA to understand how Afrinex can contribute to it. The most important thing which we all saw today uh, through the discussions and which is yet to unfold is that SECPA is expected to bring significant Philip into bilateral trade between India and Mauritius, both ways. At the same time, it is expected to bring a lot of Philip through Mauritius for multilateral trade with the rest of Africa. That's the intention and the impression that SECPA brings with it. So what does it mean for us in Mauritius? It basically means that for Mauritian entities, you can expect more growth opportunities, and all such growth opportunities, when they are there at your door, you are not necessarily always holding reserves to cater to them immediately, which means there would be need for significant growth capital for Mauritian companies. It would also mean that with opening of opportunities, companies from India, could also be for companies from the rest of Africa, looking at Mauritius as a hub for doing their businesses, as well as to take advantage of SECPA. Uh, in fact, that's what we would want, more and more African companies taking advantage of Mauritius to take advantage of India Mauritius SECPA. So all of these would mean, um, as a market infrastructure institution for us, what is it that we can contribute? One, of course, is in terms of helping raise this growth capital, which could be equity, which could be debt, uh, which could be uh, helping them structure in terms of funds. Um, and in fact, we have been seeing a lot of interest on this uh, from African uh, companies, from Indian companies, from global companies. So, and that's one of the reason why Afrinex is an exchange has uh, primarily started with focus on the primary market side. So um, we have launched only one of our platforms for primary market, which is the Afrinex securities list. And um, in 
the 11 months since our launch, which was less than 11 months, we launched in October last year. So we have already listed securities with market capitalization of more than 6.6 .6 billion, uh, primarily on the debt side, but also on the equity side. Um, from across the world and also a few African companies. So what that means is there is a lot of interest for this growth capital. And if you see the type of industries these companies are in who are raising their capital, they are in the sectors where all these um, opportunities are emerging in the new global order be it in the bullion side, be it in the agricultural space, be it in the services sector, be it in fintech. So um, it's, it's a wide variety of products. And uh, there is significant need of growth capital, and that's why they reach out. So we think as Afrinex, um, we can bring global investors closer to these issuers, or as we call the companies, from Mauritius, from India, from Africa. We have seen attraction in this. As Afrinix, we also pro pro plan to introduce several new uh, platforms for listing, which will further augment these companies to look into other ways of listing, other opportunities of listing. Um, and that is going to be their strength. Why? Because Many of these companies, when they look at uh, targeting globally, they come and list to get a certain amount of visibility, a certain amount of credibility to their corporate governance. Now that is what each of these platforms of an exchange can provide, and we, that, is, that has been our motto as Afrinex. So we look forward to that. I think there is a huge opportunity, and the more we provide such opportunities, these companies will actually find uh, strength when they try to market themselves internationally, when they try to uh, penetrate the markets internationally. So I, I think there is a huge opportunity here on the primary market side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krishna. Very exciting. Um, corporate governance, good governance at the core, and then the, the multi-dimensional of technology for the platforms, very exciting. Uh, Sunil, I'll go back to you and to, 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 to Sam. I mean, with that uh, introduction from, from, from Krishna also, how, how is SEPCA helping enhance uh, the product and service offerings of the Mauritius IFC, and how is it helping us to move uh, on the value chain in, in this positioning process. Yeah. Your views. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try to bring you back uh, down memory lane a little bit. Well, not very far, far down the memory lane, uh, about three, four years ago. You know that Mauritius came with a blueprint for the financial services sector, which was driven by the Ministry of Financial Services together with the FSE. And what came out very clearly uh, from that blueprint was that Mauritius had to embrace higher value add services so as to take it to the next level of growth for its financial services sector and to further enhance the imprint of Mauritius as an international financial services center. So they highlighted that cross-border investments, cross-border banking, wealth management, were, should be the key uh, focus areas of Mauritius going forward, and of course, this also means capital raising. So far, we've not made a lot of, 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 of progress on the wealth management side, okay? And yet, when you look at uh, the amount of uh, private wealth that today exists in, uh, in Africa, I was looking at the statistics, there is about $2 trillion of private wealth currently sitting in Africa, which is expected by 2025 to grow by another 30% and reach $2.6 trillion. So that's not insignificant at all. And I believe if Mauritius wants to uh, make any form of inroads into that important uh, uh, activity within the financial services sector, I think we need to bring in some in, you know, well-known uh, uh, private wealth managers or well-known asset managers to the country and, of course, use Mauritius as a platform to service 
you know, part of that two trillion dollars that are being routed to, you know, Europe, to London, and so on. If we could get, let's say, for argument's sake, only 5% of that two trillion, we talk about 100 billion, if my math is good, and that's not, not bad. Even if you get 2% of that, eh, even one, you know, it's a lot of money, and I believe that because SECPA also focuses on, on trying to, uh, you know, fuel the growth of the services sector between those two countries, and the fact that India has already demonstrated expertise in wealth management, in private wealth, in asset management, I think the timing is right to get, you know, some of those household names from India to consider. Uh, you know, uh, using Mauritius as a platform and reach out to this 1%. Eh? Maybe initially we say, okay, that's our target, even 0.5. And, and I think this would be, well, when I say India, I'm talking about building the, the, the wealth management platform in Mauritius, so we should be targeting other households from Europe or from South Africa. But since here the discussion is about SECPA, my, 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 my take is that there is a huge potential. We need to sit down together with a few of those household names, discuss with them, get them to uh, you know, understand why we want them here, and listen to them, and then tailor a, a few uh, incentive packages. Already Mauritius you know, offers, if you, if you are a fund manager or an asset manager and you decide to locate in Mauritius, and you have a AUM, asset under management of more than $100 million, which is nothing by international standards, you benefit from a tax-free uh, holiday of five years, okay? So there are such, uh, you know, incentives that are already available. Probably uh, we need to market it more, and we need to sit down with, you know, some of these African entities uh, that could bring us those, the, the, that money and convince them that Mauritius is, is one of the countries that they should be considering on their list. So I just talk about this. But I would go one step further. I think as SECPA unfolds, as Indian companies, you know, try to uh, uh, capitalize on that huge growth potential that we've mentioned, I think one area which, uh, where Mauritius stands to gain a lot is to entice these Indian companies to have their, uh, the, their center for treasury management. Let's say an Indian company like Tata is involved in selling cars in Kenya, in Tanzania, in uh, you know, different parts of Africa, uh, you know, centralizing its treasury management instead of having treasury management being you know, managed in 10 different countries. Having it centered in Mauritius makes a lot of sense. And I think that's a winner once these Indian companies would be extending their, their wings outside. Uh, well, outside means in, in Africa. But I think doing it, doing very specific activities like treasury management through Mauritius makes a lot of sense because it, do, it, it will bring economies of scope, economies of scale, and, and bring more efficiency in managing the treasury for all these activities which will be uh, being operated in different countries. And one other thing is, you know, the pension fund industry in Africa is, is still at its nascent stage, but it is growing and it's bound to grow in the future. So if we can, you know, right now, what are most of the pension funds in Africa, including Mauritius, doing? They are outsourcing part of that fund management business to fund managers sitting in London, in, uh, you know, in Switzerland and so on. For me, there's no reason, because they charge a lot of fees, but it doesn't mean that they have the better returns. I'm convinced that there are enough good fund managers sitting in India that could relocate in Mauritius and leverage on that burgeoning pension fund industry and get part of that and manage it through Mauritius. So that's another area where I think having SECPA and having a, 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 a more active participation of Indian entities would create that kind of visibility to the Mauritius jurisdiction, which then could lead to, you know, 
uh, you know, fallouts in other sectors, including asset management and so on and so forth. So I think the potential is huge, of course, as someone said in a previous uh, panel, I think this is the start of a journey. The framework has been set, the potential is there, but it takes time, it takes uh, commitment, it takes uh, sustained efforts for people to really unlock that potential. You know, it reminds me of when we signed the double taxation treaty with India in 1982. Nothing happened for until India opened up in 1992, so for 10 years, but then when things started clicking, you know, we, the rest is history. Uh, it has changed the, the face of Mauritius from an economic standpoint. It has changed the face of India uh, from an economic standpoint. So I think we are opening a new era here with SECPA. It's going to be a very long journey, a tedious one, one which would require a lot of sustained efforts from all parties. But I think it's a great opportunity and we shouldn't miss it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sunil. You've been talking about focus, you've been talking about expertise in India and bringing it together in Mauritius. My only worry, on you got me scared there. You started with 5%, you finished at 0.5%. I'd rather we go the other way, huh? <laughs> Krishna, uh, I'll bounce back on you again. I mean, you know, we hear a lot about Gift City here, and you are among the experts in fintech, market microstructure, corporate governance, and you've set up so many of the Gift City offerings. How, how would you think the Mauritius IFC and Gift City could work together in the, concept, in the context of SECPA? I think um, this is very important. And somewhere, um, when I was in Gift City, and uh, we had a couple of, in fact, this was before Afrinex was set up, there were some visits from Mauritius, multiple visits from Mauritius to Gift City, and they visited our exchange. Um, and the first reaction which we saw then from those who visited in Gift City was, um, well, it's, Gift City is going to wipe away Mauritius, it's a competition. Um, where do we stand after Gift City? I think um, that's a very, um, I would say it's probably not even perception, it's simply a um, fear factor that has, does not have much basis to it. The reasons are well laid out. Gift City has its own objective, own contours, um, and own scale to operate in. And they have certain advantages to offer, certain disadvantages as well, because no matter what you do, uh, Gift City will never be another Mauritius. Uh, end of the day, it is a special economic zone in India. Having said that, it does bring with it a lot of advantages, and the way we should look into it from Mauritius is that there is a huge opportunity for cooperation here. And the cooperation will actually be, uh, can bring multiplier effect to what we are trying to do in Mauritius as an IFC. So to understand that, we first need to understand what is Gift City. Now, the way Gift City is structured is it is a special economic zone, but for the first time, it, was, it is a special economic zone for financial services only. So it is an IFSC, International Financial Services Center. And because no financial services can uh, survive in isolation, it has contiguous with, in the same parcel of land, a special economic zone for other domestic uh, real economy sectors, which they call domestic tariff area. So what that means is it, they try to create a cohabitat of the domestic um, requirements, real economy, with the special economic zone and the financial services special economic zone. Now let's, with that context, and what we have been discussing today since morning here, and what SECPA brings with us, we are talking about financial services sector here, walking or married to the real sector, right, when it comes to promoting it. Now the opportunity that the real sector gets, apart from the financial services sector, financial services sector gets a multiplier effect because of its own, as well as for the real economy, in this case. So, one of the things that we can certainly look at is 
how to take advantage of the SEZ status because doing business with the rest of India will have its own um, disadvantages which IFSC does not bring with it. So doing businesses there, when it comes to, let's say, um, for example, we were talking about vaults, right? Now, Gift City very recently came up with a vault of, uh, for bullion, and the plan is by 2025 20, um, or 2027, they plan to go to about 600 tons of gold, and uh, 25 tons of gold and 600 tons for silver. Now, that's quite huge. Now, think of it, Africa, is the largest producer of gold and exporter of gold. India is one of the largest importers of yellow metal. And they are now having a gold vault here. Now, how can Mauritius become a hub in this value chain of Africa, India, bullion trade? Or for that matter, any of these precious metals trade? And that really brings a huge opportunity. You probably don't even need to of course, we could set up a vault here in Mauritius. I think we have been discussing that for years. And while that is on the anvil, or we, we look into the pros and cons of it, we could also look at leveraging the vault there, not investing here, but still becoming part of the value chain as Africa, for rest of Africa, for the export, for the refinery, for everything else that happens. That's a huge opportunity. Um, and if you look into it, with Mauritius today, the trade, the bilateral trade with India is about 700 million or 711 million. With rest of Africa, it is 90 billion. So we're talking about 120, 125 times a value there. So even if we get a reasonable percentage, and of course, gold is a significant part of this as well. So even if we get a small percentage of this through Mauritius, and probably we can get a much larger percentage there, we can have a huge contribution. That's one. Second, uh, let's say if you look into, um, there are many other geographies or jurisdictions who are trying to do businesses with Gift City in different ways, whichever are their strengths they're playing on. For example, Singapore is offering arbitration or has set up their own arbitration center in um, gift city, so and then they're encouraging their uh, different financial entities to set up in gift city, so, and then they're saying, okay, if you have an issue, here is the arbitration center. By the way, if there are other entities in gift city who need support, there is here is an arbitration center. Mauritius equally has one, right? And if we want to promote trade, if we want to take care of the interest of Mauritius entities, African entities, I think we have an opportunity to even have something similar. Let's say Mauritius Arbitration Center also sets up uh, uh, an arbitration venue or a seat out there which then cooperates or works through the Mauritius, uh, through Mauritius as hub for arbitration purposes. Um, the third area that we could also look at is, um, let's say if you look into um, education, Many of these universities, international universities, are actually offering financial services related course, STEM related course, management related course, and they're now setting up, you just name it, in uh, Gift City for just to promote the educational part of it. We have been talking about skill development. We have been talking about uh, several other areas. Now that also is another area where we can have universities in Mauritius participate or have uh, set up out there for equally gathering that knowledge or having that um, cooperation uh, view again. The other thing is, and I think we, uh, uh, Sunil briefly touched about it as well, when we were talking about fund managers, right? Now, Mauritius really do not have that much of a fund managers present here, nor does it have uh, a lot of history to fund management from Mauritius. To an extent, for the huge amount of fund that is here, we are actually, uh, we are actually not taking advantage of this fund sitting in Mauritius. It's others who are deciding for it. Now, what does it mean? Um, Gift City, for example, has set up their funds 
fund management takes years to set up, right? And the way they are trying to take care of this ecosystem is by, in a way, having a passport akin setup where fund managers in India are being allowed or being given a passport equivalent status where they can do fund management in IFSC as well. Now, that is something that we should really consider seriously, whereby for all these, um, uh, let's say, Mauritian entities, we are talking about uh, VCC plus structure, more funds coming here. Can we not really make them have a prerequisite of having fund managers here, which basically creates an incentive as well as, uh, um, I would say, a prerequisite ecosystem need to set up fund managers. There is a need, there is a requirement, there is a push, there is a pull, and then you incentivize them. And we could also look for reciprocal arrangement whereby a fund manager in Mauritius can offer the services of fund management in IFSC at least, even if not in the rest of India. And it could also be likewise for an outbound investment that happens from India to the rest of the world through Mauritius. So it actually is a very good channel of funds, and we are talking here about hundreds of billions of dollars, really, um, being over a period of time, of course, and that being managed by fund managers in Mauritius. So, of course, this ecosystem takes time to set up, but um, it can be done. The other thing which we should seriously consider, and in today's um, time with the new uh, ways in which FinTech is evolving, is that uh, we can actually look at having a fintech or a startup corridor between India, Mauritius, Africa, with Mauritius being the hub. Such a corridor will actually find a lot of relevance for Africa, for India, and when I say India, I'm talking here, of course, with Gift IFSC in mind, because there is a lot of fintech promotion going on there as well. Now, when you have such a corridor, it really means that for the startups, for the fintechs, or for some of these uh, companies, we really need to have incentive for startup funding, for venture capital funding, for, um, let's say, um, a, a test bed for all these different equipments or different uh, new ideas that they come up with, or a regulatory sandbox arrangement, we could also have reciprocal res regulatory arrangement between the regulators to allow such a sandbox to play out. So I think there is a huge opportunity, again, in the FinTech area, where Mauritius could well be a hub of India, Africa, and India-Mauritius um, corridor. It is, um, India is actually reaching out, if you ask me, independently, and that Indian companies are doing a lot of business with uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, um, some of the other North African countries, Egypt, Nigeria. So there is an opportunity there. I think uh, multiple areas we can go on, but uh, huge opportunity for us to there. leverage. Krishna, thank you very much. I really love the idea that we look at Gift City as this connector between the financial and real economy and see how Mauritius can be a hub and so many very, very pertinent ideas. Thank you so much. It really brings me directly to Sridhar. I mean, Sridhar, IQEQ is in fact, you know, maybe already doing many of the things that Krishna is, is talking about. But I wanted to say that the SECPA includes a chapter on economic cooperation where investment, investment services is somehow included in the financial services. Now, Mauritius has become naturally uh, a global player in the investment services segment. So how can we cooperate more thanks to SECPA? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Kevin, and thanks, CDB, for the opportunity. Um, the way I see it is, it's interesting that uh, the chapter on economic cooperation has been added recently, a few weeks back, and in that, Financial services has been added at the first. Uh, it's ironic because, um, in a way, the engagement with India, particularly when you see it from a Mauritius perspective, it's always been through financial services. 
uh, actually Mauritius has significantly led. Uh, when you take the real sector, we are talking about uh, three-fourth of imports and one-fourth of export, right? But actually, if you look at financial services, always Mauritius has been on the higher side. It's not visible in our balance of payments because actually we provide financial services to stakeholders outside Mauritius for India. You get it? For example, I'll come from my banking side and then bring, build it up. Uh, for many years, uh, Mauritius has been channelizing trade finance through banks into Indian corporates. This is called buyer's credit, many people may know. Uh, billions of dollars worth of trade finance has been channelized through Mauritius to finance working capital at a time when India was struggling to get dollar financing. So if you really see, uh, while I see that they have added financial services as an afterthought, and the second thing, what the industry which which IQEQ represents, we are, we, are, we are present today, which we call it investor services. Uh, the amount of, it's, it today contributes to Mauritius GDP are around 14%. It's a very large industry, and it's, it's such a beautifully structured industry. Uh, Mauritius IFC pitches itself at par with anyone in the globe. You can take Luxembourg, you can take Singapore, you can take UK, our services, for the type of service we give, the comprehensive service we give, the price point that we give, by far clients always vote us the best. And we have built this entirely facing India. So that's the second part. So it, it's, it's important that we have to look at it from the SEGPA and how they have added uh, that we lead when it comes to financial services and the balance of trade is in Mauritius's favor rather than India's favor. Uh, moving on, and what, what we are really doing, where we are going with the SECPA is, uh, knowledge, this entire industry, which is investor services, now I'm not, leave, I'm not getting into the banking side, investor services is predominantly knowledge. Uh, it is not some sort of uh, fund accounting or bookkeeping. Actually, it is an extension of the fund manager. If you put it simply, a fund manager anywhere in the globe wants to do only two things. They want to invest in companies where they can make 20% return, and they want to keep the relationship with their investors who give them the money warm. These are the only two things fund managers wants to do. Everything else is done by the investor service industry in Mauritius. Now you compare it with India. India doesn't have that. It doesn't have the industry at all. It's completely fragmented. And that's one of the reasons we are leading, actually, uh, I can mention a couple of our uh, competitors. IQEQs from May has set up in Mumbai. What we are really doing is, we are actually bringing in the entire gamut of knowledge of fund investment services to India, which is not available, and there is a tremendous demand from the fund managers in India for Mauritius operators to come and provide it and build that, which we will now have to see how we can actually present it under the SEGPA. So that's, that's the first perspective I wanted to present that um, compared to goods and other services and financial services, uh, we have been leading and we ne just need to package it in such a way that it will always stay. The value addition will stay with us only the areas where you need a lot of labor will go to India. Because that's how it is, because the clients obviously want to connect with the place where they, uh, they are comfortable with, and I don't want to get into a lot of details, but uh, that's my perspective. And so bringing in financial services into SECPA and getting it into the cooperation agreement, we have not had time to debate it at MCCI and other places. It's just a recent development. As we debate and bring it together, I think we will be able to unpack it in a, in a way which is a win-win for both India and Mauritius, because we are a leader in that sector. Very novel way of, of looking at it. We, we, we are almost on this collaboration perspective, but on the financial services, which I don't think we've been talking about that much huh, from Mauritius to India. So thank you for this. 
And let me just bounce off this same idea to you, Shridhar. Um, Krishna has been talking about gift city and, and has actually convinced us in many ways that you know we need to work in a collaborative way. How can we have an open dialogue on this collaboration with gift uh, IFC? Do you think, I mean, you who have had a foot in both areas and, and abroad, do you think we are inherently competitors or is there enough room for, for both jurisdictions? Of course, Krishna has given us a, a very positive viewpoint, but I, I really wanted to have, maybe for the audience, also have your, your point of view there. Thank you, Kevin. It's, a, it's an interesting question. I'm sure you all want to know <laughs> the answer. Krishna obviously gave us a good facet. I did visit Gift City uh, just before COVID, February 2020, spent an entire day to understand uh, that whole ecosystem and all those things. Um, and surely we are going to set up in Gift City. IQQ will be in Gift City in 2022 because the clients want us to be there. Uh, but the way, again, I would see Gift City and, and taking, complementing what Krishna is saying, uh, I think there is a place for both Gift City and Mauritius IFC to coexist. This is my uh, strong conviction after seeing it, studying it, listening to clients. Recently, we spent around a lot of time on the road in India speaking to various clients. Um, because Mauritius IFC, because of its presence over three decades, has developed certain, uh, it's like wine, you know, you cannot make good wine in three years or one year. Whatever technology we bring, wine has to age in a cask. You can't just take it away. Then it's not wine. Maybe it's port wine. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what has been developed in three decades cannot be developed in three years. I'm not saying that negatively for Gift City because Gift City has in certain verticals, as nicely pointed out, they want to bring in a lot of trading. See, Gift City is not actually entirely towards Mauritius. There is a misconception here. If you really speak to the Indian stakeholders, they are very upset that the rupee dollar pair is traded in billions of dollars in Dubai and Singapore, which is unfair. If it's a rupee dollar, it should be traded in that particular country. So actually they have moved quite a lot of, it's called non-deliverable forwards. Non-deliverable forwards is you're basically doing trade on an asset. You're not delivering the asset at all. So the place where that asset is loses the money. In a way, they have been quite successful in that. I think they have already moved billions. I think it's close to around 200 or 300 billion dollars of trade per day has already moved to Gift City. And this has nothing to do with Mauritius because we don't do it. We are not part of that. So that's one thing we have to understand that Gift City is not necessarily focused towards Mauritius. Uh, and the other thing which Gift City cannot do uh, see, while Gift City looks at investments into Mauritius, uh, Mauritius is extremely sophisticated in actually investing anywhere in the world. To give you an idea, this is again not visible. We all think that global investors come to Mauritius to invest in India. Actually, I thought it for a long period when I was in Standard Chartered. Actually, once I moved into the operator, IQQ being the largest operator with around 200 funds, I was quite surprised when I was sitting in boards. Large US investors use Mauritius only to 60% of their time to invest in India. They've, they've understood the ecosystem so well, actually they use Mauritius to invest everywhere. A bulk of investments into China are going from Mauritius. You don't even know that. See, these capabilities Gift City cannot because it comes over a period of time, it comes with sophistication, it comes to how to manage things dealing with that. Uh, so, so that's the second part. But when it comes to fund administration itself, um, I believe uh, it's a win-win. You know, I would say, I'd only quote the, the poem on you'd all heard about mountain and the squirrel. You know, they both were competing and obviously I'm not going to go through the poem, but it ends with saying, uh, the squirrel says, uh, neither can I carry mountains or trees on my back, nor can you crack a nut. <laughs> so I think we will coexist and we'll beautifully coexist because the Indian market is so large. India is already the sixth largest economy. Very soon it will be the third largest economy by 2030. I think it would want jurisdictions like Mauritius to cooperate with it. And that space is available in Gift City. 
beautiful way to, to, to say that. And I think all of us are reassured to hear resonance between both of you on, on this collaboration perspective. Our, our panel is about beyond financial services. We have been talking about beyond financial services in the traditional sense, but with the first three participants, it's Let's call it still financial services, huh? but the beyond part. But we go to Vidya, who is really, I think, beyond. Huh? We will be talking about ICT, an ICT where, where India is a, is a major player. But Vidya, from your experience of the ICT services sector, uh, how do you see this sector developing through SECPA? Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and thanks for having me. I think it's, it's I'm encouraged by your, by your thoughts, Trader, yeah? Um, I think as opposed to financial services, which has been much more mature in Mauritius for a number of years, I think if I look at ICT today, ICT, we're trying to figure out exactly what is, does this all mean to us, SECPA, India, Mauritius, Africa. But like uh, Krishna mentioned, maybe we need to think about this corridor thing, how we define it for many different industries. But I'll start by the encouraging thought. Today, India is a superpower in ICT services. Yeah, ICT services is much more broad. Uh, you have digital services, et cetera, et cetera, but I'll just use this terminology. Um, if you look at the, the industry, the ICT industry in India today delivers like $191 billion 2020, employs four and a half million people, and 73% uh, of this is exports. So India has actually proved to the world that you can actually deliver high level, you can develop products and services and export it to the rest of the world. So this kind of make it like uh, a given that Mauritius can also play in this, in this space. I think the real challenge for us, given the size that we are, uh, how do we actually fit in, in this, into this whole ecosystem? Um, and, and I think this kind of uh, make us go back to the drawing board, unlike what you have already established in terms of the maturity of the financial services, how in, in, in ICT we can actually develop, being creative with what value Mauritius can actually bring to the table, connecting the one and a half, 1.3 billion on the east to the 1.3 billion on the west. Um, and I think I'm encouraged by the fact that today uh, when I look at uh, the whole ecosystem, I mean, we've, sh we've heard some, some data earlier that uh, India has 2,000 plus startups currently valued at 50 billion, which, which will be valued at 150 billion. A lot of these guys are actually investing big time in Africa. Um, and I think this is the, the future for us will be how do we actually connect into this ecosystem by developing forums and, and, and structures where first there will be uh, exchange of information and knowledge, everybody understands each other, where each can actually bring to the table the, the, the thing that is complementary to each other for, so that we can be successful. And how can we also through our, uh, our hubs and block and economic blocks with Comesa, et cetera, so like how can we make this much more easy for our Indian partners to actually get into Africa um, and I heard earlier that uh, there's a plan to actually set up an economic uh, park or something, whatever that shape that will take, would I think be a value uh, for uh, people on both sides to understand exactly what's, what's feasible. And I think India has a lot to offer in our space, in ICT. Um, and I think there is a lot of learning we can have from, from uh, the companies in India. Um, and uh, there are two things, I think. If I look at uh, the, the two biggest avenues for our industry, and there's a lot of convergence with financial services, we'll talk about fintech. Fintech is a big thing that is also changing a lot of the, of, of the profile of the companies in our industry today uh, because fintech uh, is making available services that before were not possible. So a lot of companies in our sector are actually delivering fin fintech services, although we are not con considered as financial services. Uh, so fintech is a big one uh, because in uh, Africa need uh, money. Yeah, I mean, people have to travel in a bus a whole day to go to a bank. 
um, with digital uh, currency and digital money, this is going to solve a lot of problems. Um, and, and there's a, a lot of other things I can say about the fintech, benefit to Africa. And the second one is about education, ed tech. Uh, if you look at Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, 18 million youth are actually coming to, on the job market because they don't have universities to go to. And Africa needs education at scale. And, and I think this is a space where Mauritius and India can partner to deliver that education to the folks in Africa because today we have proof that you can actually deliver education e electronically. There is a lack of teachers, uh, there's a lack of universities and, and buildings and infrastructure in Africa, and the only way we can actu actually achieve this is to use technology. So I think if we look at the ICT industry in Mauritius and we say, okay, how can we actually capitalize on the opportunity that SECPA uh, offers us, I think we need to make choices, yeah. We are small, but we need to be focused. Which are the one, two, three uh, avenues that we want to proceed? Uh, because we need to build the skills, we need to increase the knowledge of the market, etc. And I think this is there where we will have an opportunity to, to make a difference here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. In fact, at the end of the day, tech and fintech and, and financial services, a lot of synergy. But Vinya, I know that Ceridian has has, in a way, already proven itself, or at least have piloted projects where you've been helping Indian companies go into Africa. I mean, through that experience, can you elaborate a, a little bit more on, on how India and Mauritius can work together on this broader landscape? And, and really, what are the advantages for Mauritian companies to work with India on, on those matters? I think first, first I'll, 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 I'll talk about how we actually work with our, our partners in, Africa, in, in India. Yeah. Um, first of all, Ceridian, we are a product software company. And uh, we build software for the human capital management uh, space. But we also have a very strong fintech business because we have our own wallet. We move something like $315 billion a year uh, through our business because of the nature of our business in payroll and tax. Um, but we also now have offices in Bangalore. So we have about 700 colleagues in Bangalore, software developers, implementation consultants, and technical support. Um, and we have, I have actually been working with providers like TCS and Cognizant and all the rest, and I've been managing these relationships in India, primarily because of the talent, yeah. Uh, sometimes we can't find enough talent in Mauritius at the speed that we want it. So for us, strategically, this is something that we will continue to need so that as we expand, we're growing extremely fast. We're growing like 25, 30% year over year. And the only way we can actually absorb this, this, this volume of work is to have partnerships, yeah. And many of those Indian companies I mentioned, they are global. So they are in South America. When we want to grow in South America, I worked with one of our partners in Uruguay where their folks speak Spanish. They can actually serve even the North American market, the Spanish-speaking part of this. When I want to work in uh, Europe, mainland Europe, I can work with some of these partners in Eastern Europe where they are based, and they can provide languages and skills that we don't have in Mauritius. I think increasingly, the Mauritius companies need to think about if you want to be much more global, you have to kind of work with a company that's already global and then find how you can leverage their, their expertise and their capacity and also the, their knowledge of the market. Yeah, I think that's very important. I mean, sitting in Mauritius, just going to Google won't teach you a lot of things. Yeah, you get like the, the, the one dimensional view, but you have to experience the regions, the culture, what works, what doesn't work, what type of work makes sense in certain regions and not. Uh, so I think for us, this is how we leverage with our, our Indian partners, yeah. And, and increasingly, this is part of our strategy. We want to do this more. In addition, for us, having officers in many Asian countries today, including Bangalore, as I mentioned, we will need these partners to actually accelerate uh, our expansion. And I think Mauritius also need, before Mauritius, we were, we were looking at India as a competitor, yeah. So when, when, when companies in the US will look for, for service providers, they will talk to Mauritius, Philippines, India, and we will make, make a pitch that, oh, we can do this better than Philippines and India, et cetera. I think we need to change that way of thinking. We can do it 
because we now have partners in Philippines, in India, in all these places. And, and I think this is a, a, a new way of rethinking our industry as well, because we have been very siloed in our thinking, and the future is about partnership. Increasingly, okay, uh, we work with the Lord PwC, Accenture, etc. they implement our software, and that's the only way we can expand. If we say, okay, we want to just grow organically, then we'll probably grow back 5% a year, okay, because of the pressure that is on talent. And I think uh, this sector is actually making us question the way we operate, and, and we can't take too long to do it, these guys. Yeah, we, need, we have to be fast because this industry moves so fast, and we need already to have a roadmap uh, where we want that industry to be leveraging what India can bring to the table and also the market and the opportunities in Africa. But yeah, thank you so much. I would like to say something from what you've said, and I love the future is about partnership, and that is because mountains can carry trees and squirrels can uh, break nuts. I think really that summarizes what we, what we are saying today and the fact that we have with us now India, which is a pool of talent and a pool of opportunities and you know a pool of money also. So all that with Africa brings a lot of sense to the services market. Before we open up to questions, I would like to point out though that for once, I think we've been able to reverse the trend. We started with a much smaller audience than we finished. So congratulations to all of you for your amazing uh, presentations. But perhaps a final parting words, of a minute or two on what you would like to say, maybe in the sense of, are we ready? Are we prepared? What do you think is required for this partnership to crystallize? And I would like to hear your final thoughts, all, f all four of you and then perhaps open up to a couple of questions before we end. Vidya, I'll start with you, with your final thoughts. I think, the f first of all, I think uh, our industry and the financial services industry need to sit together one day and understand what each, of a, each other does and how we can help each other. I think this is where we should be starting because today the borders are getting br more, much more invisible. And unless we know our strength, unless we know the depth and the breadth of the expertise that we have in Mauritius, we cannot really sell Mauritius. I think that, that's where we need to start. Second, we need to understand exactly the markets, okay? We, where do we want to focus on the markets? And also build those linkages and these hubs with, with our partners on either side uh, of, of Mauritius. Uh, and then let's have a roadmap, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vidya Shridhar. Uh, thanks, Kevin. I think uh, from, from my perspective, um, in financial services, we were all caught up with the double taxation treaty for a very long period, which actually sort of masked our thinking. It got renegotiated, and we are actually sitting at a very important milestone where we are talking about economic cooperation with respect to financial services. So it's almost version 2.0 in terms of our engagement with India when it comes to financial services. Maybe it's just a thought which has come to my mind that maybe EDB should uh, uh, commission one more um, you know, exercise with capital economics in terms of what is the impact we have created uh, on India because the work done on Africa is very good, but I think it's good to do that. And as we go in, we are going to play a very important role because India has grown, as you saw, for the last decade at, at around 5.8%. We can see that the amount of wealth which has been generated in India is so much now. It has become a country which is investing both at the individual level and the corporate level in other countries. That's what we are good at. So we need to change the narrative from the Mauritius financial services piping in uh, investments into India into how we can actually, using the SECPA cooperation, do what other countries are using Mauritius for, for investing, and how Indian excess wealth can be invested much more efficiently through Mauritius, because that's a completely different perspective, and that's what a SECPA is all about, looking at economic cooperation from a new perspective. That's Thank you very much, Vidar. Krishna? Um, I have an observation that um, 2004, SECPA uh, discussion started ended in 2022, 21, so almost 17 years of uh, on and off discussions. And uh, Gift City, 
in the context in which the entire discussion or most of my questions were started around 2011 and it's 2022 when uh, people are looking at it much more seriously than they ever did rather post covid so we're talking about uh, factors of decades here one uh, little over a decade we give city and uh, secpa which is little over two decades <laughs> so i think um, as much as as it might sign, sound like a brand uh, a brand of some other company, but we just need to do it now. I think we have, we, we deliberate a lot, many of these things. We really need to have a specific sector by sector game plan and execute on it. SECPA, if anything, is uh, uh, Philip or a uh, catalyst in doing it now rather than doing it later. This is going to create the demand. The opportunities will be there at Galore. It's about how do we encourage um, and probably how do we have the push and pull both uh, to leverage it right now. That's, that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krishna. Sunil? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, in economics, there, there is a saying, uh, you know, says law. Huh? Says law, says supply creates its own demand. So in a certain sense, the authorities have created the framework. So the supply is there. The question is whether demand will follow. But listening to uh, some statistics, for example, this morning, uh, the Minister of Finance said that exports to uh, India has grown within a very short period of time from 800 million to 1.3 billion, a 66% increase, of course. in our well, in world terms, 1.5 or 1.3 billion is rupees is nothing. But it shows that there's been a lot of progress in a very short period of time. And I think from the Indian side to Mauritius too, there's been about 66% growth. So I think the seeds are, have been sown. Of course, for such a project with so big ramifications to take the shape, uh, that it should take and uh, that it can potentially take would require, uh, you know, sustained effort, as I said. And, and I always believe that, you know, if there is a strong business case, and we've all here discussed about what we think are these strong business cases, it will happen. You know, it's as simple as that. If there's no business case, we may come up with as many incentives as we want. Not much will happen from it, but based on all the statistics that we've shared with regard to what India represents as a powerhouse, with regard to what Mauritius as a jurisdiction presents in terms of all the advantages of you know, using Mauritius as a platform, with regard to all the huge potential that these two African blocks that I've mentioned present, I think uh, there is definitely a lot of potential there. Probably we would need to put our fingers on, you know, it's like uh, when you create an architecture, uh, like you build roads, you just need to figure out what will make the traffic flow and flow in a fluent manner. I think we, the, author, the authorities, EDB, but also the private sector needs to sit down together uh, understand what, what is it that will make the flows increase and increase substantially. I was talking to Samad and discussing with him, and he mentioned one very important point, uh, free flow of, of, of people between Mauritius and, uh, and India could be something that can be very important and which would certainly uh, was, uh, meet what Vidyan was saying. Uh, because we know that probably passporting talent, having qualifications which are recognized between these two countries, are uh, some of the soft but very important factors that would make things click. But by and large, I think if we put our fingers on the right, you know, factors that will drive this forward, uh, the rest will be, you know, how the economies grow what kind of uh, you know, uh, size do we reach, whether we reach the critical size, and all, all these fronts. I think both Africa and India have a lot of potential of growth, and Mauritius sits nicely in between 
to get this, uh, the glue between these two blocks. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. You know, I started my introductory remarks saying we had the graveyard shift. I changed that now. I think EDB saved the best for the last. So really a big, big round of applause to those <laughs> panelists. Uh, I certainly am extremely energized on beyond financial services after listening to them. Uh, we will open the floor for questions. I will have to have the guidance of EDB uh, about how much time we are left. I know the cocktail is meant to start five minutes ago. So maybe I can get three questions maximum uh, and I will take all the questions and we'll see who can answer them. If there are any, uh, please, the floor is open. Or if they've been superb and explain everything, we can also save it for cocktail time and you can ask it directly. So I'll leave the, f I'll give you one more minute. I think there are no questions. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for having stayed with us. And thank you again to all the panelists. Bravo. There's not much for me to say other than to thank all of you, the uh, speakers, panelists, and also to say that uh, we're very grateful for the tremendous insight that we had. Uh, this morning I said something that the uh, market access remains a key component of the socioeconomic development of Mauritius. And I think I will also echo the views of the Honorable Prime Minister when he said that uh, back in the 1980s, what made the difference in terms of market access was uh, the Mauritius Export Development Investment Authority. And today in 2022 and beyond, the Economic Development Board has that responsibility of ensuring that what is signed in terms of an agreement is translated into concrete action. So the EDB, uh, I think, uh, stand ready with all of you to make sure that the uh, agreement becomes successful in implementation. And this is a pledge that we take together with the business community for the prosperity, the good being, and socioeconomic development of Mauritius in the years ahead. So with that, I want to thank you. I want to thank all the staff of EDB who have relentlessly for the past one week, in fact, we had one week to organize this. So I want to say a very big thank you to all my staff and especially to the team from Global Outreach, Vipre. I don't want to mention any names because then people will say I forget them. But I just want to say that it's been tremendous pressure for all of us to organize such an event and thank you very much. We now have the cocktail. Before the rest.